Well, hello. Little Jones Martini Whisperer here. Welcome to my home. Welcome to my bar. Welcome to Will Gin Day 2022. Can you believe it? Is that the time already? See, June is quite a special month for me. We have World Gin Day. And next week is World Martini Day. And I'll be doing another recording uh, for you, which I'll share through my channels, my website, talking about a few topics that some of you have sent to me, questions that you want to know about martinis, insights, etc., etc. So look out for that. In the next 15, 20 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about sort of gin, really, and my relationship with gin. And that, not always, <laughs> well, it's a, it's a very enthusiastic one, shall we say. Um, I've been fortunate to be thinking about gin, writing about gin, drinking gin, uh, working with gin, working with distillers for almost 12 years now, now or more. If you don't want aware, I used to have a restaurant background and a tourism management background. And so I was exposed to wine and fine spirits as part of my, um, my education and part of my, my work as a fine dining manager. Walking around the world, and like in Canada and London and places like that. Cheers to you. Mm. Bone dry Plymouth Dolan. Olive, very happy. But we are literally living in the golden age of gin, friends. I've probably said that a thousand times already, but it's true. Way, way back in the day, you know, even in the early 90s, late 80s, there was a handful of interesting gins, uh, but the main, the big commercial ones, we all know. And then a war thing came along. This came along. Hendrix Gin, Scottish. Now you don't usually put Scotland and gin together, and yet they broke the mould with this one. And global success, a world deserved success. And I remember sitting in a bar in Queenstown, New Zealand, drinking a Hendrix gin and tonic with a cucumber garnish. I think it was the finest thing I'd ever drink in my life, pretty much, outside champagne. And so it began. Uh, and then we sort of started seeing this evolution and releasing of these very interesting premium or super premium, as I'll call back then, uh, gins. Uh, one of the first, of course, was the very elegant Martin Millers um, out of England. And there was a bar here in Canberra um, called Julep Lounge. And David Nguyen, some of you may know, as a world-leading bar, bar mixologist in Singapore and Australia and many other places, he had the bar there. And so he uh, was one of the first to get his hands on it. So that was a real revelation of, I've got to say, especially in the context of a martini, just how good a martini could be with the right spirit let alone the right person making it. So that was an epiphany, the Martin Miller's gin. I'll have a little sip here. With, you know, really commitment to quality, um, beautiful water, use of lavender, and all sorts of interesting botanicals. And so suddenly you had finesse and elegance in a gin bottle. So that was really, really exciting. Parallel to that, we had this kind of craft gin, craft spirit moving happening overseas. Places like, I've got one here. Incy bincy bottle of uh, St George Spirits in the Bay Area in California, which I had the pleasure of visiting several years ago. They make amazing, at scale, but for them, they've been going, I'm going to say almost 30 odd years, maybe 40, quickly if I'm wrong. Sorry guys, St George. Amazing distillery, super lovely people, and I had the privilege of a private tour there when I was there a few years ago. Um, amazing setup and very, very committed still to handcrafting their botanicals. So uh, um, they've, got a, they've got big, bold California flavours. Needed to say, very terrific expression of place, and they were distilling at the time. They make a gin which uses a lot of Douglas fir pine needles, and so they'd gone out the day before and harvested the team had harvested a whole bunch, and they were doing the, the the spirit run for that. Fantastic. Parallel to those guys on the other side, come aviation. This is out of my freezer, hence it's nice and cold. I like mine bone freezing and cold. And yes, it's got associated with a well-known actor these days, and it's been a movie or two. Um, but I really rate, they kind of, again, get a beautiful bottle, a bit of packaging. And when this started washing up, so to speak, in Sydney and bars in Melbourne, uh, again, a really epiphany of really interesting flavours. American gins, generally speaking, are very forward in their flavour profile and not, uh, not, for the, not shy, as befits American gin. Um, I like this cinema tea again, quite dry with a lemon twist. Uh, and then if you like licorice and sarsaparilla type flavours, this is a gin for you. But yes, that came along about the same time. And <laughs> I'd only heard about this because this is like going back a few years now. And I was in a bar in Sydney and was quite excited to see it on the menu. This bar in Manly, which is no longer there, and this is probably just as well. Um, so I ordered it and uh, the martini came. I was going, oh, 
quite what I expected. It's okay, but not, and I walked up to the bar going, I'm, I'm really sorry, but is this aviation gin? They went, no, it's Tanqueray. Don't you like it? I went, no, I don't. So I, anyway, they're not there anymore. They're used to better bars. So yes, so aviation came along and then you start to see, you think of Tanqueray, so I'm starting to see a bit of a pushback from brands like Bombay, my Gordon, and also Tanqueray. So Tanqueray responded, if, if, if you like, in the, in the light of these new wave sort of craft gins, uh, new world gins, um, or contemporary style gins, or new western gins as they're starting to be called then, uh, with their number 10. Now say what you will we about Tanqueray, this is a solid, decent bit of kit right here. Uh, beautiful, deep, rich citrus flavours. Um, bartenders love it. It's, uh, it's 47.3 ABV, so it punches above its weight a little bit as well. Um, so they came back in a pretty classy way, do Tanqueray, and it's a bit of a classic for a reason. Now, I'll come to Australia in a minute. Um, and then, of course, my old faithful, which I'm drinking right now, the ever-immortal Plymouth Gin. Please stop buying it. It's getting hard for me to get. <laughs> I have sauce now, and they keep some behind the counter for me. Um, so there's no ad. I buy all my gin. Uh, all this usually is pretty much bought by me. Well, if it's not, I'll let you know. But yes, I like its little gentleness, its subtleness. And it's been around since 1700 and change, right? So, fantastic. Um, this, however, is always in my top 10 martini gins. The Jensen's Bim, Bimots, I can't even say it, kids. Bimotsi Dry Gin. Now, this was, again, we're talking oh, over 10 years ago, maybe more now. Um, it was just a rumour on the interwebs, and the interwebs were quite young then too. And I'd heard whisper of this super uber dry, very elegant uh, London Dry Gin. And the story goes that um, a gentleman, I guess Mr Jensen, uh, was working in um, Tokyo and gone to some amazing little bars I have there. I'll come back to those in a minute, a bit later. And uh, had a fantastic gin and reminded him something, but that's the last little bit of whatever that thing happened to be. So when he came back to, he made a lot of money, came back to London, and so to kind of recreated or create his own sort of very bespoke high-end premium gin. That was the result. And it's super flinty, super dry masterclass in handling juniper, friends. Um, very, very austere. A lot of hauteur, as the French would call it. Um, I absolutely adore it. And it can be a bit hard to find. There's another version, which is the old Tom gin. Has almost the exact same label, so be careful when you pick it up. I've often been to shops where they misfile them, or because it looks just identical, just, just fine print at the very, very bottom. Anyway, so I was so keen to get my mitts on it, um, I tracked down the phone number and called up the office. Excuse me, cheers. <clears throat> it's been a long day. Uh, yeah, so I got through, and it's very, uh, dare I say, it, very attractive Eastern European kind of woman's voice answered them. Hello, can I help you? This is Jensen's gin. And I had visions of, of her in, you know, couture and heels and at a glass table in a sort of very elegant office. I could be completely wrong. But that kind of came back with the brand association. So this eventually turned up and I think I first had this in the real and Gin Palace in Melbourne about a year later. And it's been in my top 10 ever since. So you see a bit of a trend emerging here where, where this, got this new wave of spirits were emerging, lots of innovation, creativity, still commitment to craft and the premium end of spectrum. And then you had some of these major, major commercial companies responding in kind, and they all had different releases to do that. Um, so let's go talk to Australia for a minute here. So our, this is aviation was turning up. Now remember, I got my start in this crazy little gig um, by creating the, uh, the Centenary Mont Martini for Canberra's 100th birthday. So you can do the math. It's called the Centini. There's a north side and a south side version because the locals would get that reference. And we had amaz amazing kind of response to that and it launched the National Press Club. We raised money for charity. Very, very memorable experience. At the time, because I was looking for them, there was only maybe three or four gin makers. There was West Winds, there was Kangaroo Island, uh, Blue, something out out west, uh, New South Wales, and maybe one or two others. So I wrote to them, and then and West Wind's gin came back to me saying, what can we do, we'd love to help. And of course, the Maiden Eye legends out of Victoria came to the party too, in all sense of the word. But the original distillery, 
was Kangaroo Island. And uh, many people have heard of um, Bill Larp, the famous uh, whiskey godfather of Australian whiskey. Um, but he's got a twin, well, brother, Bill, and his lovely wife, Sarah, who on Kangaroo Island, a legendary place off the um, South Australian coast, were probably arguably the first Australian gin distillery. They've just expanded, apparently, and but in, with using local botanicals, and this is the one they'll notice, 48 koalas, because they went through some dreadful fires there, so this is inspired by the koala population and and, um, and their recovery. And also the first ever, they've been pioneers from the get-go using native botanicals, including things like samphire and so on. Goes. So when I had the launch of the Centini, they'll always be very dear to my heart, because on the back of that experience, they were the first to reach out to me, going, love what you did with, you know, West Winds and the rest. So my glass is very dirty. Um, here's our new vodka, would you like to write about it? It was just a hobby blog at that point. But yes, that's how I, I got to know them. Um, I've unfortunately never had the actual opportunity to go there for various reasons. Anyway, so they sent me um, not too long ago, they were thinking they rebranded since then, this uh, new release. So they're very, very thoughtful, generous people. And um, are now making their own, well, locally grown juniper as well which is the one. So this is Australia's first single origin gin, which is pretty exciting. So it's actually really delicious, beautiful, very subtle and aromatic. So Kangaroo Island were there from the get-go, so to speak, and then we are now, and I'm just looking at my website, and again on my website, <coughs> put that out of the way, as you know, I've been tracking um, Australian gin for, as I said, for over a dozen years now. There would be many imitators, shall we say, but I was there first, which is and every month I add some more. And we are now friends up to 509 Australian gin makers in Australia. Uh, I've got an approval, so we call it 515 and change, shall we say. Uh, this is a lot of gin, friends, can we? A lot of gin, a lot of gin. So you go to my website, go to article index, and you will see all the, all the rums and others so every month, update it. So I'm due to an update pretty soon too, because this keep coming, which I'll come back to in a minute as well. Um, so let's talk about New Zealand. So I've had the pleasure of being a New Zealand spirits judge uh, in Wellington a couple of years ago, and of course you know what got in the way, otherwise I would have been there. And they launched their, they had their, their winners announced just the last couple of days, so well done, New Zealand. And a real privilege, I was the first international judge um, to be invited over there, so a great honour. Great people, great hospitality. Wellington's a fantastic city. Really good drinks to be found there. And uh, yes, and so this is another example called Island Gem. And look at this packaging. It's just exquisite. Just beautiful. Now, very interesting um, as an Aussie, because where we are besotted with lemon myrtle, which I can't stand, uh, pepperberry, da 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 da. Um, sorry, lemon myrtle fans out there, it's just done to death, frankly. Um, but they, of course, they have their own botanicals as well like a manuka and um, cloberry and things like that, which they have own form of pepper. <clears throat> and hand forage botanical. So uh, last I looked, it was probably about 85 New Zealand gin makers. So Ki Ora, Kiwi Pals, if you're watching. Um, love this stuff. And it has across the board, I must say, that they are quite successful. And by that I mean the handling of botanicals, the quality of the water is amazing. Um, the base spirits usually very well handled, and so it's quite hard to judge because they're, they're, they're generally very, very good. But as an Aussie trying to get your head around or you paddle around these very distinct botanicals can mess with your head and it's hard to pin down. So yes, I have to get back there to Aotearoa another day. So here's to that. Back to Australia. So we've had the emerging kind of American kind of spirits, the, the response from the UK, um, the emergence of Australian craft spirits, and as we've gone from uh, three or four to over 515 now, and they just keep coming, um, to other countries. But I want to give a shout out to these guys, um, Andrew Marks at the Melbourne Gin Company. Now, at the same time, a very, very well known Australian gin um, was released about the same time, and at the same year as these guys who got all the publicity and all the hoo-ha and all the love and still had probably half 50% market share. These guys deserve a better shake, personally. I, that Dava gin is probably the least interesting gin I know. I know people love it and they drink it. And I see people in the shop 
um, and they looking at all the shelves and you know the, the the spirit retailers are doing a great job of you know pushing you know Aussie gins now and things like that or power to them are uh, and yet this Melbourne Gin Company really kind of got, a, it was kind of like overshadowed by that commercial success. Um, fun fact, let me drink first. Here's the Bull Gin Day, friend. Um, in any given year, you might have uh, maybe $100 million of sales in Australian gin. Of all, no, so try it again. In Australia, there's about $100 million, thereabouts, probably more now because of probably COVID, of um, gin sales. Of that 100 million, all the give of change at retail value, that 10% is Australian craft spirits. Of that 10%, half is this other really popular um, gin, which I don't talk about because it, they, they don't need me to talk about it. Um, and then there's everybody else, the other 514 or so of them, most of whom are small businesses, most of whom are regional rural operators, most of them are husband and wife teams doing amazing things in fantastic locations inspired by their place. And they're the ones who turn me on, so to speak. They're the ones I, I want to visit. They're the ones I want to share with you. They're the ones I do review on my website. Um, they're the ones who put it all on the line, second mortgage, third mortgage, sell the kids, anything, but they just want to make gin, right? And uh, they're the stories I want to tell and will continue to tell and share with you. But the big commercial guys, like they're fine. They can, look after, they can look after themselves. But I shout the Melton Gin Company for Bear from the get-go. Lovely, earthy, he's a winemaker, Andrew Marks, from the Yarrow Valley, just out in Melbourne. Um, so if you haven't tried it, this is why I chose this uh, gin, along with a very new one, uh, came out last year, uh, Stuart out of Adelaide, called Little Juniper, um, for my martini pack, which is sold through uh, gin, tonic, gin tonica in uh, Melbourne. So I chose one of the earliest modern era Australian gins and one of the newest Australian gins, paired up with Regal Rogue, a fantastic uh, vermouth, Australian vermouth, uh, to make your all martini packs at home. So uh, look at first. It's on my side as well, but don't go talk to Gin and Tonica because we've only got 15 left or something. So shameless plug. Let's go to Japan, right? And then I'll let you guys go have another drink. So everyone knows about how good Japanese whiskey is. Fun fact, foes, uh, it's not always Japanese whiskey. They've just actually put a voluntary code in the industry there of distillers, uh, where it has to be A, made in Japan, distilled in Japan, bottled in Japan, single source. Yeah, it's a bit of a wild, it's been a wild west kind of thing, because once I just, people the world had discovered, like our friends who made gins of gin, had discovered how good these spirits were, they were just kind of making for themselves. And suddenly they had to catch up with this global market of whiskey fiends. And so you've got to look at the labeling very, very carefully. And you go, that's a whole other story for another time. Anyways, they're now gone on the gin bandwagon, just the same way as Italy has, as Greece has. Spain have always been gin fiends. Apparently the world biggest drinkers of gin is the Philippines. So if any Filipino friends, cheers to you. Uh, I've no idea about Filipino gin, um, but you hear it seems to drink a lot of it. Then the Spanish and then everybody else brings up the rear. So he's a gin lover everywhere. Anyway, so yes, so Japan's on the bandwagon. And uh, fun fact, a couple of years ago, before you know what, uh, I was all set to lead a tour in partnership with a local uh, tour operator to Japan for two weeks, visiting distilleries and some of these amazing cult cocktail bars. At 20, uh, about 16 people only, half the tickets were sold and then there was typhoons and then pandemics and whatever. We still may do it. We still may do it. And I was going to be the first ever person to visit the famous uh, Kyoto Dry Gin with my little party of cocktail and gin and martini lovers. So yes, uh, now the Kyoto Distillery, Exquisite Bowl, there is another one floating around. Have I drunk it already? There's another one, but I drunk it. <laughs> There's a range of these, but this is the original, the dry gin. There's a, um, a central gin, a green tea and other things, which are just exquisite. Um, Western, Western uh, distillers, and it's deemed to be probably one of the best gins in the world. They win all sorts of awards. Up there were Herno and there's some amazing Scandinavian Dunker Brandery out of Scandinavia. And uh, my friends, if you don't know already, if you want to delve a bit into Scandi gins, go to my website. I've got some guest reviews at the end. I've got some uh, dear friend, uh, especially this time between um, Denmark and Sweden. Uh, fantastic guy. Just 
uh, won an award for his book on with some colleagues on Swedish gin, and we did a live chat this time last year, um, sort of lockdown situation. So a fabulous, fabulous gin. So on my site, there's a whole bunch of reviews um, of Scandinavian gins there. And, and so a colleague, um, Simon, uh, who lives in Japan, um, did some reviews in depth about this range as well. So um, Kenichiwa Simon and all my friends in Japan. So they, they're kind of new to the scene. And so uh, there's a great discrepancy, shall we say, in terms of style of what you see in Japanese gin. Uh, I was saying, talking before how American gins can be characterized by big flavors and big expressions. Australian gins in love with the botanicals. New Zealand might be a bit more restrained, uh, but still inspired by their place. Um, and so it goes, but uh, each distillery in Japan will have its own take on it. And so what you might get from Okinawa is going completely different from what you get in Kyoto, and so it goes, which is probably understandable when you think about it. And so often the case they are Sake makers by day and gin makers by night, so to speak, all certain times of the year. Anyways, so bottom line is this is probably the most single, most beautiful gin I know. Um, I'm probably going to look forward to it. You, it's like the Montreux, you know your wines, the Montreux of gin. Elegant, sake based, subtle, rich aromatics. It's just so beautifully crafted. Neat by itself, um, but in a martini, it gets very cold, very dry. I'm going to like. Uh, it's just a master class in how you make a gin, frankly. What I look for in the gin, I get asked this a little bit, and I've got one final shout out before I go and let you guys get back to a new cocktail. Is, um, is that all these things have to align. They have to be, um, how to put it, I like when I'm judging spirits, it's like it does, the, does the nose, the aromatics line up with the palate? Does are the botanicals balanced? Do they make sense? Is design there? I, I did a thing a few years ago um, with a colleague Paul who's got a truffle farm in, in New South Wales, in the Southern Highlands, and we made truffle mad gin. I was a consultant on the project, and making truffle gin is really hard. And so we were at the point where um, the contract distiller out of South Australia did an amazing job. There's an article about it on my site if you want to, have to check it out. I'm quite proud of how that turned out, but at the end of the day, it was really her effort. But we we're talking about 5% here, 10% there, the way the balance of botanicals out, which is why I guess gin is such an exciting category. Because we end up having 25 different prototypes, and we landed after I did the market testing for it, and, um, and we ended up with two very different styles, almost like a winter version, a summer version. And, but he, it was his money, he, had to kill, he made the decision about which one. And uh, yeah, it was a very, very exciting process. And we went, okay, we'll press, Locked that in, Eddie. Let's go for that one. Um, but it's hard. It's really hard to make a really good gin. It's harder still to make a great gin. You think of all the elements, the technology that goes into it, the timing, the insights, the, the, the water, the base spirit, the choice of botanicals, the treatment of those botanicals. Um, all these things need to come together, and then you've got to find a place to sell it. And so Again, in Australia, we have one of the third highest tax regimes in the world in terms of you get a bottle of gin and a third of that will go to the tax man in the form of excise when you sell it. So a very challenging proposition. So all power to all those 515 or so of the gin makers, all power to like 6,500, I reckon, estimated gin makers around the world. And may they prosper and continue to thrive and keep, keep creating the good stuff. So my friends, um, World Gin Day. We're very fortunate to live in the time we are, to be in a place of such beautiful products. And one of the newest ones, by the way, um, this land on my desk, and this is not a shameless plug. Uh, winemakers, of course, are in the in the zone now. It's a Tempest Two award-winning distillery in um, Hunter Valley, north of Sydney, New South Wales, has sent me their latest release, and um, it's kind of a Shiraz base. So again, unique expressions emerging. I think that's the next big trend. We've seen seasonal gins. Uh, we've seen um, ones that explore certain types of place, occasional kind of gins. So I think at the end of the day, you just got a thing that floats your boat, your comfort zone kind of gin, and then the special occasion kind of gins. Um, well, there's gin for every occasion, isn't there? So anyway, enough of me. You go get a drink. Stay well, drink better, have great company.